So, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, this is going to be a session on passwords, um, security, and Drupal, uh, past, present, and future. I'm Drew Weber, um, McDruid on D.O. and most other places. Um, so, oh, that was working a moment ago. Okay, so, sorry, uh, we'll go through the sponsors quickly. I recognize that name, uh, that's who I work for, Acquia, um, Wonder and Platform SH, and the gold sponsor, so thank you to all of them. Uh, the obligatory, who am I? This is my D.O. profile. I've been on D.O. for about a uh, little over 10 years. I've done some contributions to Core. Um, I co-maintain a, a handful of modules and nowadays have sort of a, a security slant on, on my interests in Drupal. I work as a security analyst at, um, at Acquia. So why do we care about passwords? Why would we be here talking about passwords? This is a story from Hacker News from two days ago. Uh, I believe that, I don't know if you heard the story about the Gen2 Linux team um, having their GitHub account taken over, um, they apparently just revealed that the, uh, this amazing high-tech hack was perpetrated by someone guessing their GitHub password. Um, so it's, whilst passwords seem like, you know, a really trivial thing that sort of we should all be beyond that now, if you like, uh, it's still regularly... The, the weak link in the chain when it comes to security. Um, and I've personally seen several websites hacked into just because they had a rubbish, easy to guess password set on an account that had you know, admin privileges of some sort. So it still happens all the time, um, despite the fact you'd think uh, in this day and age, uh, you know, we wouldn't need to be we wouldn't need to care about passwords anymore. So what we're going to go through in this talk, uh, we're going to talk about how Drupal Core handles passwords, look quickly through how that's changed over the years, uh, how bad actors leverage passwords, um, how to implement password best practices, uh, look at a few what not to do's, and then um, a quick look at the future of, of authentication. So the first bit is how does Drupal Core handle passwords? So this was pretty much as far back as I could go in the history of the, the Drupal um, code base. I believe this is from the you know, tag 1.0. Uh, the commit there is from 2000. And you can see that when Drupal was given the password, it ran, it built a SQL query and just used MySQL's built-in password function to hash the password. So the good news is that it, Drupal, it doesn't look like Drupal has ever stored plain text passwords, which obviously is a good thing, but uh, it was using MySQL's built-in uh, password hashing function, which the MySQL docs say, don't use this, it's only for internal purposes. So in Drupal 4, uh, this code commit was from 2002. Um, Drupal Core is now doing an MD5 on the plain text of the password. Um, and it actually stayed like that for quite a long time. Um, it was still, Core itself was still just doing a, an MD5 on the plain text of the password all the way up until Drupal 6. Um, Drupal 7 introduced this change where there's a pluggable password.inc which you could 
it provides your own if you wanted, and then a user hash password function. So it's no longer just doing a plain MD5. And in the background, in the, the uh, password ink which was provided in Drupal 7 uh, used the PH pass uh, implementation of password hashing, which it was available in Drupal 6. I'm not sure about Drupal 5, but it was available in Drupal 6 as a contrib module, but it got into core in Drupal 7. Drupal 8, uh, as you'd expect, does everything in an object-oriented way. There's a Drupal service, and it's the hash method on that, which is now called to um, hash a password for storage in the database. So I mentioned uh, phpass. It was a contrib module in D6. It got put into D7 core in 2008. It's also been used in WordPress, Joomla, and a handful of other open source projects. Um, it was, it's developed by uh, the, the people behind openwall.com, which is also, um, where they're the developers of John the Ripper, uh, which we'll mention again shortly. Uh, in D8, there is a uh, phpass hashed password class which implements the password interface, so that's how it all works now. So if we look at um, a Drupal password hash, if you look in a Drupal 8 database in the, in the relevant uh, table, it's not just straight, I don't think, in the users table anymore, but if you look straight in the database, you'll see hashes that look like this. So on the left-hand side, the first, I believe it's the first 12 characters are what's called the setting. So the first three indicate what type of hash uh, it, we're looking at. The fourth character is a, get this right, base64 encoded log2 count of which tells the hashing implementation how many rounds of hashing you have to do or has been done on, on this password. And then the, the next six characters, uh, sorry, eight characters, are the salt for the password. So Drupal is now storing what's called a, a cryptographically salted hashed password. And all the rest of the hash there is just the sort of gobbledygook output of the hashing algorithm. So if we just, I try not to spend too much time and read every line of code. I know everyone probably in here can read code as well or better than I can. So what, what the, a few of the functions do, this is one of the main ones that generates the salt. So we just looked at the, it actually generates those first 12 characters, the whole setting of the, pass, of the password hash. So we've got the, uh, the sort of signature, what type of hash it is. This is, as I was talking about, the single character that represents how many rounds of hashing have to be done. And then there's the random salt which gets put in uh, to the hash. So I don't know how easy this is to read from back there, but um, this is the actual implementation of the, of the hash. So you pass in uh, those 12 characters of setting, uh, or it might be the entire hash that gets passed into this function, in which case it knows just to look at those first 12 characters of, of that uh, to, so that it, it can tell what type of hash it's dealing with, how many rounds of hashing it has to do, and what the random salt was. And then there's just a, a while loop. Um, it takes the that single character and knows from that how many rounds of hashing it's supposed to do. Um, I have got it in my notes somewhere, but I think at, at present in Drupal 8, it's something like 64,000 rounds of hashing. So it goes around this while loop, puts the salt in with the plain text password, and then does the, the hashing, um, the actual hashing over and over again. And then the output of the function is that 12 characters of setting again, and then the, the actual hash concatenated onto the end. So the checking of the password, obviously when, you're fir when you first give Drupal a password, it needs to do this hash for it, but also when, you're, when it's trying to authenticate someone with a password, it needs to compare uh, 
that password against the stored hash that it has in the database. And this is how it does that. So it gets, it has the plain text password and it has the hash from the database for this particular user. It goes through and decides what type of hash it is that it's looking at. Uh, there's backwards compatibility for older styles of hash from earlier versions of Drupal and that type of thing. Um, but what it will end up doing is a comparison using, there's, a, there's an actual hash equals method instead of the comment there is saying, you know, instead of just a plain comparison with the computed hash. So it's, it's effectively said, given that plain text password uh, and the setting which comes from the stored hash, generate the hash again and then compare the one that we've just computed with the one that's stored in the database. And there's a hash equals method as opposed to a plain comparison in order that you can't, uh, it's not vulnerable to timing attacks. If it was a really uh, a naive comparison, then there's theoretical possibility that someone would be able to figure out that how quickly this responds with a positive or a negative. You'd be able to infer some information from that as to, so, you know, timing attack. So that's how um, Drupal Core uh, stores passwords. I think I skipped over it, but I was going to mention that, yeah, in Drupal 7, this um, count was uh, a D, which represented 32,000 iterations of that while loop, roughly. And the idea is that with every major release of Drupal, we increment this number by one. And because it's a log two number, that means in D8, it, did, it does 65,000 rounds of hashing, and in D9, we'll double that. Um, the idea, obviously, being to keep up with the uh, Moore's law, if we still believe in Moore's law and that type of thing. So how do bad actors attack passwords? I asked my wife for some inspiration about, you know, what can I use on a slide to illustrate uh, bad actors? Uh, and she came up with, you know, credit for, to, to her for the, the idea there. But um, this is what some of the main ways that bad actors uh, use passwords and leverage them, uh, try and use them as an attack vector. So you've got brute forcing, cracking dumps or hashes, and social engineering. Those are probably the main vectors, if you like. So brute force, obviously, is fairly simple. You just try and log in to a Drupal site over and over again, trying to guess different passwords. Uh, there's lots of different strategies you can follow with brute forcing. You can try literally just start at the single character A and keep on going through every possible character. Um, that tends to take quite a long time to arrive at a real password. A very common way of doing it is to use a word list, which are often derived from previous dumps of databases where, you know, a site's been hacked and we know uh, given, you know, whatever it is, 30 million Yahoo users, lots of them had the password ABC123. So that's high up in the list of, of the, the word list that, that you try. So this is an example of a, a tool called Hydra trying a brute force attack against a Drupal site. And it's trying some really bad passwords that are high up on, on those word lists against the login admin. And it's successful with admin password. Uh, I have actually seen that in real life uh, on you know, a prod site. So you, it's, it's hard to believe, but it does, it does still happen. So how can you mitigate against brute force? Well, Drupal has actually got a really good mitigation in place in core, and it's been there a long time, and it, I think it's sort of one of the unsung heroes of Drupal core. Um, it's to the extent that there, in core, there's no admin UI for flood control. There's just some settings that live in, you know, in D7, they're variables, in D8, it's config, but there's a few settings uh, about user flood control. We limit, um, IPs to 50 attempts, and there's a window of, of 3,600 seconds. And for individual user accounts, five attempts within 
216,000 seconds, which I, sorry, got that wrong, 21,600, which that's six hours. So what that means is that by default, Drupal won't let you try and log in to the same account, let's say admin for sake of argument, with incorrect passwords more than five times within a six hour window. And that stops the vast majority of uh, brute force attacks being successful, um, or at least it slows them down significantly. Um, one slight problem with uh, the, the brute force, with the flood control in Drupal core at present is that um, it doesn't actually log when it starts to block brute force attempts coming in. So I, I filed a core issue uh, at the start of this week and we'll try, I'm gonna try and get that change into core so that there's at least an option for us to do some more logging uh, when, when Drupal starts blocking brute force attempts. Because obviously, if you see one IP address continuously trying to brute force all of your admin accounts, you're probably gonna want to block that IP address from accessing your site. A, a mitigation that you can do, though, is to just look for these patterns in your logs. Um, so if, if you're continue, Drupal core does log failed login attempts. And if you see lots and lots of failed login attempts, uh, you know, maybe from the same IP and then it suddenly succeeds, maybe that's a bad sign. It might just be that someone was drunk and fat fingering their password and it might be legit, but there's a possibility that that it would actually be signs in your logs of somebody having successfully brute forced one of your accounts. The best mitigation, obviously, though, against brute force, really, is having really decent passwords, and then they're unlikely to get guessed. But we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. So password cracking. What, what we mean by password cracking is you have the, you're, you're a bad actor, and you have the hashes from Drupal's database. So there are people who argue that this stuff's not really all that important because once somebody's got their hands on, you know, details from your database, then you're, you're in trouble anyway. Um, and there is some truth to that, but uh, the whole idea of improving the hashing algorithms in Drupal core and that type of thing is just to make this, to give you more time essentially <coughs> and to make life harder for anyone who's sitting on a list of your hashes and trying to crack passwords from them. So in Drupal 6, uh, without that contrib module, these are just plain MD5s uh, of, the, of the plain text password sitting in the database. And we men I mentioned earlier on John the Ripper, this tool. This just illustrates how quickly John the Ripper can zoom through those MD5 uh, hashes and derive the passwords. Again, the, I mean, these passwords are particularly bad, they're very near the top of word lists, but John the Ripper didn't even take a tenth of a second to derive all three of these passwords from those MD5 hashes. And when you're talking plain hashes, like M just a plain MD5, there's also the possibility of using rainbow tables. There, there are you know, downloadable rainbow tables out there with the MD5 hashes of millions and millions of different passwords, and you can just look up the hashes directly in those and find out what the, what the passwords are. So you don't actually need to do all the computation, you just need probably a very big disk to download massive rainbow tables. Drupal 7, so now we've implemented this uh, phpass salted hash. Don't know how good, how, how well you can pick this out, but you can see those, the D there is the fourth character and that tells us that it, it was only using 32,000 odd rounds of the, of the hash each time, but those are salted hashes. Um, John the Ripper can still crack these passwords because, I mean, it's an interesting quirk of all of this that the, the salt is not a secret. It's not like, you know, Drupal holds the, holds the salt as a secret and it's not available if you were to grab the, the, the hashes out of the database. The salt is there. All the salt is really doing is making it computationally much more costly to derive the, the hashes. So in this case, John the Ripper took 20, just over 21 seconds with given these three hashes with terrible passwords. So 
obviously that's a huge um, jump up from being able to do it in less than tenth of a second for the plain MD5. Drupal 8, there's our counter gone up one, so we're now doing double the amount of the rounds of, of hashing each time with our salted passwords, and John the Ripper took 42 seconds here. The actual number is obviously not important. This isn't a big password cracking rig or anything. It's just the relative values that we're interested in. So you can see, based on that evidence, the, the idea of the salted hashing making it more computationally costly to crack these passwords um, would seem to be working, and you would guess that given the same you know, CPU horsepower or whatever, if you double the number of rounds, which we'll be doing in Drupal 9, it will get more computationally expensive to crack those passwords as well. Um, the key, though, is if you don't have such absolutely rubbish passwords, it will take an awful lot longer than that to crack them. But it's quite interesting to look at how long it takes to crack terrible passwords. So I mentioned uh, rainbow tables. This isn't specific to Drupal at all, but just uh, uh, you know, an interesting fact. I was talking about terrible passwords. These are rainbow tables that you can just go and download off the internet. That's the the, the character set in use there is the full ASCII range of characters up to eight characters long, and the full download of the rainbow tables is is you know somewhere in the region of 500 gigabytes. So that's if you wanted every single possibility, uh, and if you jump up just to nine characters, that download, you know, would, would maybe not fit on, well, no, sorry, it's, it's you know, seven to 800 gigabytes when, once you're up to nine characters, and that's only with a mix of alphanumeric um, characters, so we've lost some of the, of, of the entropy there in, in make, limiting the character set. But this just gives us a clue about how important password length is in terms of trying to guess passwords as soon as once you get up currently a, around eight or nine characters it starts to get really really difficult to look up passwords in rainbow tables and to crack them not that you can do rainbow tables with salted hashes anyway but that's just a bit of an illustration so still talking about password cracking for another minute or two um, I'm sure everyone's probably seen this great XKCD comic where he comes up with correct horse battery staple as a better password than the sort of gobbledygook leet speak um, password combination which is, which is hard to remember. It's true that, you know, by itself, correct horse battery staple, because it's long, is hard to crack, but there's an interesting article here about, a, a, about approaches on cracking long passwords and pass phrases and the, it's a fairly simple idea. You just take word lists, like this is Google's, Google reckons these are the 10,000 most commonly used words. Take those and start just combining two of them at a time and generate hashes for it. Um, and for, if you're only down to two lists, two words, sorry, um, this article write-up reckons that Hashcat can break that in less than one second. Uh, if you go up as high as four words, it starts to get much, much harder. But just the idea here is if you're, if you're just combining dictionary words, then it, it's not, you're, you're, the entropy is, is greatly reduced by the fact that you can try and crack them just by chaining dictionary words together and, and the actual total number of possibilities comes down a great deal. You're not talking anymore about whatever it would be, you know, 32 random characters, you're, you're talking about effectively four words out of a fairly short list of dictionary words. Um, so here comes a, a shameless plug. I've talked, about, um, drop, I've talked about John the Ripper already. This is a, a Drush uh, command, which I wrote and maintain. It's called Drop the Ripper, and it effectively... Is, is like an implementation of John, John the Ripper, but within Drupal. So uh, instead of, if you're trying to crack Drupal passwords as, a, as an administrator, instead of having to take the hashes out of the database, put them in a text file, fire up Kali Linux, something like that, with this you can just install uh, drop the ripper as a drush command. Um, 
type a, a couple of options there and Drush effectively will start running through a word list of bad passwords and using Drupal's own hashing code to try and find out whether um, those passwords are present in your database. One of my colleagues, uh, Cash Williams, who's in the Drupal security team, came up with a brilliant suggestion to add this restricted option, which, because in Drupal, there isn't really, uh, you know, it's so flexible, there isn't really a concept of an admin user, but what you can do is look at all of the roles in your system and check whether that role has at least one permission which is marked as restricted. So what this does is goes through and checks all of the users who have at least one role which has at least one restricted permission in the, in the database. So these are the users effectively that you probably don't want somebody to be guessing their password and brute forcing. So I've, I've got uh, a write-up about how to do, how to use a t Drop the Ripper or other tools uh, as an admin to audit um, the passwords on your site. I think it's a really good idea to do this because it enables you to go and say to, your, to one of your users, you've got a really, really bad password in place. Can you change it before somebody manages to brute force? Um, so social engineering. Um, to some extent, this is a really difficult problem to solve from, you know, from a Drupal developer's point of view. Training is really one of the only good mitigations against effective social engineering. If, if uh, Kevin's going to ring up one of your users with an admin account and start asking them, you know, saying that he's from the IT department and he needs to check their password, can they give it to him over the phone or something, then you're in trouble. So training is, is one of the only sort of soft mitigations, if you like. But obviously, things like multi-factor make, make a social engineer's life a great deal harder. Um, you just have to hope that uh, your social engineer is, is not charming and convincing enough to ask for both the password and the one-time login off the, off the user's smartphone. And so, password best practices. Um, NIST recently, the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology over in the US, recently uh, published a set of guidelines around passwords. Um, they are pretty good in general. They um, tend to be in favor of being more user-friendly and less prescriptive about what you do with users' passwords. So uh, password length is one of them. They say that you should have a minimum of eight characters, and if you're going to impose a maximum length on users' passwords, then it should be at least 64 characters. So, I mean, that eight characters ties in with what we were talking about. You know, an eight-character password is much, much harder to crack or to brute force um, than a, a, a much shorter one. The password policy module in Drupal uh, has the ability to set um, a, m a minimum length constraint on your passwords. So that's quite an effective way of implementing this best practice. And in fact, the password policy module uh, is definitely one of the best ways of implementing the NIST guidelines. NIST also talk about composition. So they say, you know, allow all the ASCII printable characters except Unicode, including emojis. Don't prescribe composition rules. So don't say, you know, you must have two lowercase characters and two um, punctuation marks. All of those, the, the whole idea of the NIST guidelines are that the more prescriptive you are around all of that stuff, the more you force users into bad practices, bad habits. So if you can be user friendly, it's better. Drupal's pretty good. Um, obviously, I mean, we, we've got quite good support for Unicode, but because we're storing a, a hashed password in the database anyway, it doesn't really matter if you, it works it typically. If you fire in your password as a bunch of emojis, it, it just works in Drupal, unless pre presumably you might be able to set your PHP up in such a way that multi-byte strings confuse it, but typically emojis and that sort of thing just work out of the box in Drupal. In terms of composition, there's a, a module called password strength which 
implements a library which was originally, uh, com it, it was Dropbox, I think, that originally came up with it. And instead of forcing those sort of rigid composition rules, it has some algorithms which try to measure roughly how difficult to crack a password would be. So they look for a few particular patterns in it and they give you a rating. So you, password strength is now a plugin in Drupal 8 to the password policy module and you can specify that you will not accept passwords which this library thinks are either weak or average. You know, you could, you could say that you, you uh, enforce um, at least a password strength of a, a score of two or three or something like that, and that should hopefully uh, prevent users from choosing really obvious bad passwords. The NIST guidelines recommend that you screen against known bad passwords. So there's a few different ways you can do this. Uh, the password policy module does have um, the ability to have a blacklist. So you can take one of those word lists, like the one from Drop the Ripper, and you could, have a, you, you could tell your site about the 2,000 worst possible passwords and have password policy actually just refuse to let users set ABC123 as their password or whatever it is. There's another really good way of doing this, though. Uh, Troy Hunt's service, Pwned Passwords, which is um, one of the services he runs under the Have I Been Pwned site, allows you to check w for a given password and see whether it actually appears in the millions, in the database of millions and millions of previously uh, cracked passwords that he maintains. There's a few implementations of this in Contrib. Unfortunately, we've, uh, it seems to be one of those cases where three or four people all came up with the module all at the same time, and, and it's a bit confusing to know exactly which one you should use. There is um, an issue. Hopefully, it will land sometime soon for it to be one of the plugins in password policy. And if, that, if and when that gets released, I would probably say that would be the way to go. Uh, so Drupal actually sends part of the, a SHA-1 hash of a given password off to the Pwned Password service, and that will come back with a number of matches if it looks like that password is in the database that so has been cracked before. NIST also recommend that you use multi-factor. It's almost certainly one of the best ways to guard against your passwords being a problem on your site, and Drupal has the TFA module which is which is fairly mature been around for quite a long time um, it with, with uh, plug-in um, modules to that you can use most of the big services like Authy or Google Authenticator or whoever else to implement two-factor and there are other options out there in in contrib so a quick mention I've talked about password policy I've talked about password strength I've talked about TFA Generally, these are all quite, you know, they've been around for quite a long time. They're sort of quite mature, quite usable. But we have a problem in Drupal 8 in that all three of these are still in alpha releases. And those are the numbers of open issues that each of them has in the, in the queue. So it, a bit of a, a call to arms to say, you know, it's a shame that this is Friday, the last day of the of dev days and not Monday where we can all go off to the sprints and see if we can help in their issue queues. But if, if, if you are looking for any way to contribute to, uh, to Drupal modules, then these, I would, you know, say put these three somewhere near the top of your list if you can go and help out in their issue queues and preferably not just going into one of the issue queues and shouting at them about when are we going to have a stable release because that's probably not very helpful. Uh, what not to do with passwords. A couple of these are um, tie in with the NIST guidelines and a few of them are just silly things. So security questions. NIST recommends against these now. There is a module for Drupal where you can implement security questions, but this is an illustration of why it's a bad idea. Um, here's a, a security researcher saying after a Yahoo breach where security questions were part of the problem, uh, you'll need to reset your mother's name and uh, grow up, on, having grown up on a different street. So it's, it's quite difficult to reset these security questions if they get breached. So they're generally not a good idea. Password hints also, uh, not a great idea. Um, it's 
amazing what users will do if you let them. Uh, th this is a write-up, a really interesting write-up of how badly Adobe had implemented password hashing uh, when they had a giant breach and hundreds of millions of, of uh, hashes and, and other details from their database leaked out. But it was a bit of a clue in the database, in the details that were available, where the, the type of password hints that people had entered into the database, for example, the password is password. So if you're sitting on a database dump from that site, the password hints have made your life quite a lot easier there in some cases. Not a great idea. Password expiry is an interesting one. Unfortunately, it's still, I don't know if any of you have had to deal with um, FedRAMP compliance. It's obviously the US government compliance, uh, which is some, some quite onerous hoops that you have to jump through. The FedRAMP guidelines still recommend, I think it's every 60 days that users, you force users to change their passwords. Generally, most researchers have decided this is a really bad idea a long time ago. Um, there's several write-ups about it. This Bruce Schneier is, has one of them on, on his site. Uh, the idea is, obviously, if you force users to change their password every 30 days or every 60 days, they tend to end up choosing really crap passwords because you're, you're inconveniencing them and making them change it so regularly. Uh, it tends to do more harm than good, and NIST now says, don't do this. If, you, if you're set up for your users to be choosing good passwords in the first place, then that you shouldn't need to make them change it. Unless, for example, you know that a developer left a DB dump in the open on one of your servers and it probably got breached, and then you probably do want to get everyone to change their password. Assume that the user will change me. Um, this is something that we, I, I'm sure I've been guilty of it as a Drupal developer before. You know, setting up a site, we've got a, an editor role and a contributor role, and I need a test user to, that has each of those admin roles, and I'll just set the password to the, the same name as the username or something like that. And, uh, you know, when we, set, when, we, when we launch the site onto prod, I'm sure the users will set decent passwords, uh, but they tend not to. Um, so, yeah, as a developer, don't put crap passwords into the system and assume that someone else will sort that out before it ends up on production. Uh, and it's also worth mentioning, uh, even non-production sites with really crap passwords on them, unless they're locked down or, you know, behind basic auth or something like that, where we've seen um, bad actors hacking into staging sites because of crap passwords and then trying to use them to do bad things. So just don't put bad passwords in the database in the first place is the, the moral of that story. Um, this is not a particular Drupal thing, but uh, I was actually helping a family member a little while ago set up a, you know, get set up using a, using a proper password safe. And this, this was a, a banking website and I don't know if you can read this, but it says, due to security reason, right-click is not allowed, and they don't let you control and V and paste a password from your clipboard into the, into the password field. You've probably come across that somewhere out on the internet. It's really irritating if you're using a password manager and you've got a really decent password waiting in your clipboard to go in, and if they force you to type it out character by character, again, totally go against the NIST guidelines of trying to be user-friendly. The, uh, the title there is because there is a Firefox and a Chrome uh, plug-in and add-on uh, which stop sites from, you know, mucking about with JavaScript and preventing users from doing uh, paste. But just don't do it in the first place as if any of us ever would. Um, this, again, doesn't actually have anything to do with Drupal, but it's just so ridiculously bad that I wanted to mention it quickly. Uh, worse than storing your passwords in plain text in the database, this was for, uh, admittedly from quite a few years ago, but it was a UK hosting company, I think, and I was having trouble logging into my account. I clicked on their password, I'd forgotten my password link, and they sent me an email that said, you know, we've, we've in the interest of security, we're not sending you your password, but here it is as in, a, in a JPEG file. 
so you, if you open that up, you'll be able to see your password and then you can log in again. And when I opened up the JPEG file, this wasn't my real password, but it had an ampersand in the password. And the reason that I was having trouble logging in is that they'd encoded the ampersand and that was what was stored in the database. So when I actually logged in by typing ampersand AMP semicolon in place of the ampersand, it allowed me to log in. So I thought that was worthy of a sort of hall of shame. Could you implement passwords any worse than that? I'm not sure you could. Um, so just very quickly, the future of authentication when it comes to Drupal. I mentioned multi-factor already. Um, if your site is important, if you're, you know, you're, you, the, your users logging in securely is important, I think you'd need to have a very good reason not to be implementing multi-factor these days. Uh, and it was something that they, the Gen2 guys said, you know, they, they're doing that straight away on GitHub after their embarrassing incident recently. Um, there's various sort of single sign-on implementations available in Drupal. Simple SAML PHP seems to be one of the really popular ones at the moment. I often think it's slightly ironically named because it doesn't seem to be very simple for people to get it implemented for some reason. But once it's up and running and working, it seems to be pretty good. Um, there's various other options, OAuth 1 and 2 and LDAP and social login. I mean, this works quite well, obviously. Uh, if, you're, if most of your users, for example, are always logged into Google, it's quite easy to just essentially outsource all of this authentication stuff to Google and say, right, will you worry about multi-factor and password composition and everything else, uh, and we'll just log you in using, uh, using Google Auth and all of that stuff. Um, there's, there's decent implementations of it available for Drupal. Uh, just very last thing, a couple of mentions of other things that have been, you know, that, that have been tried. There's a passwordless module where every time you want to log in, you go to the site and you give them your email address and they email you similar thing to the Drush ULI link and you use that to log in every single time uh, and never type a password in. Uh, maybe that's a, a better idea than just ordinary passwords, but it doesn't really seem to have taken off in a massive way. Um, there's also you know, client certificates where you install a certificate in your browser and that's how you authenticate to the site. There are, there are modules that implement that on Drupal, but again, it doesn't really, it, you know, the numbers suggest that it, it hasn't uh, taken the world by storm, but it, it's possible and there, there, there is a module for that TM. Uh, and that's it, I think. So, yeah, thank you. Any questions? Um, you shortly mentioned SHA-1, and I think SHA-1 has been had some vulnerabilities over a couple of years. Is it still being actively used in Drupal? Or? It's not, as far as I'm aware. Um, when I mentioned SHA-1, that was in the context of the uh, Troy Hunts, have I been pwned um, or pwned passwords uh, service. And the, the first version of the API the idea was you could either send the plain text password to the service in an API call and ask, has that been, is that in your, you know, has that been pwned effectively? Uh, or you could send the entire SHA-1 hash of the password and say, is, does that SHA-1 hash appear in, in the database? Um, it's not used to actually store anything in Drupal. Uh, and just while, you know, talking about that API, the, I, uh, when I initially, I, I wrote, uh, um, a, a pwned passwords module uh, to, to implement that service. Uh, and I was a little bit nervous about sending the, the entire SHA-1 hash over the wire to um, pwned passwords. I mean, it's over, it's HTTPS only, um, but it still made me feel a little bit nervous. The version two of the API, they've come up with a new way of doing it where you actually only send I can't remember whether it's the first eight characters or the first 10 characters or something like that of the SHA-1 hash. Uh, 
uh, over to the in the in your API call, and the response actually contains a list, if there are any, of all the matching SHA ones from the database that match those first ten characters. So it, it's quite a clever implementation, and it means that you're never sending an entire plain SHA-1 hash over the wire of, of your plain text passwords. But no, it's not. You, I don't think anyone would recommend using SHA-1 uh, to to store hashes these days. The, um, what's the FIFO use now? No, you do I think it's SHA-512 okay. inside that. So, but that's it's pluggable um, and. That's the, that's the hash that's used inside that while loop. So you, you've added the salt in, and then you do tens of thousands of rounds of, of um, I think it's SHA-512 by default, but I would have to check to be certain. I'm pretty sure it is, though. One quick last question. Um, the salting that happens in Drupal 8, um, you mentioned that that salt was easily discoverable. Does that mean it's like hard-coded, or is it generated for a site installation? Or It's actually... It's uniquely generated per Thank password. You. So the, the interesting thing is that, if I can get back to it, it's not, um, yeah, what I was saying is it's not a secret. Um, it's actually there in, in the hash. Um, and it's unique for each individual password. Each hash which is stored in your database has, that, has its own hash its own salt, I'm sorry. But um, the idea, it's not a secret, it's actually there in, in the hash, and the, the way that it gets used is that once it's been stored, if you, when you're authenticating to Drupal and you provide the password, um, say you, you, you're trying to log in as user number one, Drupal goes and finds the hash which is in the database for user number one, and it's able to take the first 12 characters of the hash and know, and, and those are then the settings that it will use when it computes the hash from your plain text password in order to compare it against the hash which is stored in the database. But it's, it's never a secret, um, which I, I didn't necessarily understand this particularly well until I started digging right into it. But the, yeah, the, the salt isn't a secret, it's just there in, in plain view if you're able to see the hash. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, when you mentioned the tests you've made with John the Ripper, um, I, I think you mentioned that those kind of attacks were brute force attacks, right? But it looks like more like dictionary attacks than brute force attacks, which makes a huge difference. Because in one case, you are just comparing with text that already exists, and the other, in the other way, you have to test every possible combination of a, yeah. a password to, in order to crack it. So I, I believe those times you presented on your slides were about dictionary attacks, not about brute force attacks. I'm honestly not sure exactly how John the Ripper implements those with the default options. I think it's capable of doing both, but you're right, there's a big I don't know difference. Which, which, I don't know if you, you use, for instance, Scala Linux to do that. But uh, if you are using, for instance, Kali Linux to yeah. uh, use John the Ripper, yeah. he, it will use uh, the default uh, dictionary passwords that he has installed on, right. the, on the distribution itself. So if sure. you use the default options, probably you are using a dictionary attack and not a brute force attack. Uh, yeah, I, I expect you're probably right. And it's um, yeah, running from, from one of the word lists of bad passwords. Okay, and the, the other thing I, I would like to mention is um, it's more like a contribution than a, a question. But there are currently today more secure algorithms for hashing passwords than uh -huh. to store passwords on a database. For instance, I, th I believe that Drupal should look into PBKDF2. Uh, bcrypt and scrypt, right. which are much safer uh, password storing algorithms and yeah. protection algorithms than SH1 or MD5, which you mentioned there, which are not secure at no. all today. And even SH, SHA256 or 512, it's uh, something that uh, it can, you can find easily already existing rainbow tables with comparison for, for, for cracking the password. Sure, yeah, no, I think you're right. I think uh, in Drupal's case, if it were storing a plain 
SHA-512, then yeah, it wouldn't be much better than when it was just storing a plain MD5. But the idea of doing the m many rounds of, of hashing with the salt is that it, it makes it, you can't, it's not it's, possible it's, then to it's use a rainbow table. Which is actually, it's not um, that safer because actually what you are doing in storing the password like that is just increasing the computational weight, yeah. both on the server for creating the password itself right. and from the side of someone. Let's imagine uh, if I get my hands on the dump of a uh, Drupal database, uh -huh. if I know the, the type of hash, if I know the counts of the rounds that you use to, to, to produce the hash, if I know the salt, I can easily do the same kind sure. of attacks. It's a question of, of computational power. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's, in terms of security, it doesn't increase much. I, I don't know if you mean. No, if you I, mean, I, if you I, know I, I mean. don't. I don't disagree with you, um, and the fact that you know the, the developer of John the Ripper was the one who came up with this implementation. So obviously, John the Ripper can crack these hashes, and because it knows all about the algorithms, that, you know, same, it, and it's all open source anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's um, it's it's definitely correct what you say that that all you're really doing is increasing the computational cost of cracking passwords that are stored like this rather than making it somehow impossible. Uh, you can't use rainbow tables or something like that, but given enough computing resource and enough time, you, you can crack them. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. The, the D.O. issue where um, PHP, PHPass was finally committed by Dries to Drupal Core, it's linked to the D.O. issue where they discussed it is linked to from the open wall ph pass uh, website where he says you know all these different projects have implemented this it's n unsurprising that it's one of those giant d.o issues that's got like 10,000 comments or something but they definitely discuss bcrypt and one of the other password implementations that i can never remember off the top of my head but you mentioned it uh, so there, there has been discussion about other you uh, of using d alternative implementations of this, but I think the consensus, if there was any, seemed to be, as you said, that essentially all you're doing is, is increasing the, the computational cost, whatever algorithm you actually use for, this, for the storage of the passwords, unless you use something completely different where, say for example, there was a, you know, a, a private key involved in, in encrypting them and that was stored separately to the data, but a completely different implementation yeah. where that would make it impossible to, to crack them without having access to that private key or something like that. But you know, you. you're absolutely right. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.